Okay, so I uh, just need to uh, make sure that Cubase actually does what it should. And uh, there we go. Like this. And now, with a bit of luck, nothing happens. That's great. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Okay, then I think I'm uh, good to go. Uh, welcome. I'm going to do a seminar on break bits, as you hopefully all know. Um, opted for the handheld mic so I can actually hear what I'm saying, uh, which might mean I'll fiddle around a bit, but I guess you'll survive. Uh, for those who don't know me or didn't read the seminar description before you came, I am uh, Ola Gundelspe from Norway. Uh, most of you uh, will know me as Lugubre. Um, it's been a demo senior for years and released for a lot of groups. These are the groups I'm actually a member of and uh, a couple of record labels that you probably haven't heard of, but they still count. Uh, so, today we're going to uh, uh, talk about uh, breakbeats in uh, music production. I will explain what a breakbeat is first, for those of you that don't know that, and just run through a short bit of history. Uh, very short bit, but still, you need to learn something. And uh, then we'll just uh, go through uh, various topics on and aspects of using breakbeats in music. Um, just uh, keep your questions coming throughout the um, the presentation, and uh, we'll try to just answer the questions as soon as you have them. If I think a question is not really that relevant for what I'm talking about, I will just come back to it after my presentation is done. And if the answer is so long that I think it deserves more time, I will also just uh, take it after the main presentation. Um, and if I understand correctly, you should raise your hands whenever you have a question, and this nice gentleman over here will uh, come to you with a microphone. And um, please remember to actually put the microphone in front of your mouth before you start uh, asking your question so that uh, I can hear it. Yeah, okay, so uh, what is a breakbeat? Um, a breakbeat is a small section of a drum beat from some track. Now, <clears throat> Typically, uh, a beat from a band or something that uses a real drum kit. So, uh, at some point in the tune, there's a small breakdown. And uh, that breakdown is basically just called a break. It's a break in the track. And uh, hence the term breakbeat. And uh, as you see, these breakdowns would be a small section of just the rhythm and percussion stuff of a tune. Uh, hence the beat. And uh, then the, they would kind of just take the track down, play a couple of bars of drums, and then would bring back the band, do the chorus or a bridge or something like that. And it's a staple of soul and funk music from the 60s and the 70s, which is the source of most of the breakbeats you have, will have heard in some track at some point. Although people still use drum breaks in tracks today, so you can sample from basically whatever. Um, Avril uh, Lavin, I'm not sure if that's the, but you know the skater boy girl from Canada, actually has a nice drum break in one of her tracks that some people sampled at some point. Okay, so uh, just some uh, famous breaks. You might not know these names, but you will probably recognize uh, at least most of them. Let's see if this works. So this is, uh, I've ordered them in uh, what I think is more probably the more used breaks. The James Brown funky drummer break is, uh, if anyone, if you are into hip hop, you will have heard this before. Let's see if this works. It doesn't because I don't have any sound. Well, that's great. Yeah, but uh, it really shouldn't. Might be because Cubase is running. No, probably not. So that's just soap cube, I just need to re-scan all my VSTs again. Okay. Oh, get it! Whoa.
And that's basically it. You have probably heard those drums a million times. And you also got a small demonstration of how this works. There's a small breakdown and this just the drums playing and then at the end of the clip you heard him taking the band back in. James Brown would often do this. He would, uh, he would basically create his tracks as jams. And he'd just stand there and shout instructions to his band and they'll do whatever he says. And they kept the instructions on the records and everything. So it's more or less like listening to people creating music live. All right, so another really, one, uh, really famous one. This is Apache, one of many cover versions of Apache. Um, let's hear it. I think my, some of you might have heard that before as well. There's, of course, for all you guys that are into uh, breakbeat music, uh, drum and bass, jungle, stuff like that, there is the infamous aim and break. And you will have heard that in Niggas with Attitude the tracks, the Futurama intro. It's basically everywhere. It's a great break. Poison by Prodigy. Then there is uh, this one right here, which is Lynn Collins' Think. It's another James Brown production, so it's basically James Brown's backing band playing. Um, yeah. It's also known as the Yeah Woo Break. <laughs> and you will have, uh, <laughs> There are several uh, breakdown sections in the track. I just picked one. Uh, there is also one with just the uh, tambourines alone. So if you listen to it again and just listen to the tambourines, you've heard that in a lot of tracks as well. Skull Snaps, It's a New Day, uh, I mentioned Poison, so that's Poison by the Prodigy, with, and you add the aim and break below it, and that's basically it, and all you need is a uh, small weird guy shouting stuff, and you have a cool track, if you're Liam Howlett. Uh, this one right here, the Honey Drippers impeach the president, uh, we're back to hip hop again, and you will have heard this before as well. That is used a lot, really a lot. But it's uh, kind of difficult to spot because it basically sounds like a generic hip hop beat, which is because the generic hip hop beat is this sample. And the uh, synthetic substitution by Melvin Bliss, also used a lot in, in hip hop and used a lot in drum, bass, and hardcore music as well. Right, so. Obviously, there are heaps more. I think I have several thousand of these on a the hard drive. And I think this will do for now. But these are the original recordings in their original tempo as they are. Obviously, uh, you will have heard them pitched up or down, resequenced. We're going to go through how we actually work with breakbeats. But this is the basis um, for, for starting out. And to just uh, finalize the history a bit, this is basically how this came to be. Uh, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, hip-hop DJs would basically play old funk and soul stuff. And then they heard these breaks uh, in the tracks and figured out, well, this is cool. Just like to have this for going for a long time. So they bought two records uh, of the same track, had two turntables and a mixer. And then they just went back and forth and just rewinding the, uh, the uh, uh, record that wasn't playing in, in time to could bring it back when the break part stops and the track that is playing. And that's basically it. And then came the cheap sampling technology in the 80s with your archives and uh, emus and whatnot. And uh, then there were no need to do this manually anymore, so you can just uh, sample it. And then you could chop it up and resequence it and uh, create new beats with the sound of the old beat. And then you, uh, of course, uh, techno music came to the UK in the late 80s. and yeah, in the early 90s, these rave music producers started <laughs> using what they described as sped up hip hop loops, which of course are these funk breaks, and just uh, increased the tempo and started making hardcore and then eventually increased the tempo even more and started making jungle. And, uh, and thus they created the, uh, what was called acid techno in the UK. I think, and I'm assuming some of the UK members of the audience will arrest me if I fuck up some uh, historical facts. <laughs> yeah, 
And today, uh, you use breaks for basically everything. You hear them everywhere. Of course, hip hop still uses it a lot. Uh, you have all the uh, breakbeat genres like breaks, drum, bass, uh, retro, hardcore, whatever. Uh, but you can hear breaks everywhere. Pop music, uh, even some rock music. So that's the uh, boring history uh, part of it. Now let's uh, just start talking about how we're actually going to use this for anything. So first of all, you have to find a breakbeat to use in a track. And uh, of course, uh, unless you're just uh, playing around, which means you just find a break that sounds cool and build your track around that, you have to find a breakbeat that does uh, what you wanted to do for your track. So you have to actually spend some thought on it. Um, of course, you could just find the aim and just chuck it in there, and most people will do that. And of course, it's a great break, so most times that will be fine. But if you want to make something that doesn't sound like everything else produced in the last 20 years, you could try to actually find something that fits your needs a bit more precisely. Uh, so what are you making? Uh, of course, uh, if you're making something nice and smooth, you don't pick a break that's big and brash. Um, if you're making some aggressive stuff, then you will pick something that's big and brash and just put the beats in the face of your listener. If you do like uh, just a nice dance floor roller, and I'll maybe basically meaning a track just rolls on, that's hence the term. It's a steady beat, people can dance to it. Then you will pick something that has some nice glue and groove and flow and some sensible rhythmic structures. Because uh, most people, with the exception of break core fans, would uh, probably not like to be just dancing like this and trying to pick up on all the 32 of the uh, of the sounds. You need something that's well just rolling. Or you could do a minimal stomper and just find, like for instance, the impeach the precedent, which is basically a hi hat to kick and a snare and just amp them up. Or of course, if there's no dance floor to cater for, or you don't care about the people in dance floor, you can basically do whatever you want. And uh, your square pushers or your FX twins will basically disregard the need for a sensible beat and just hammer away. Okay, so there's that, and then there is the tempo of your track. So if you do a track with a high tempo, you basically need to tighten everything up. You need to have a pretty tight structure, because if it's too sloppy and it's too loose in the feel, then you will basically just have a mess. So you will have to tighten up the structure, you will have to tighten up the timing, because at 175 BPM there's basically not much room to jiggle stuff around without, without it becoming a mess. And uh, I hope a lot of you were here to experience the, uh, the um, DJ set by Glicksplit and Knurky uh, yesterday, and you would have noticed it a couple of times, they just fucked up the mix just for a second or two, and you would hear two beats clanging it into two different tracks, not exactly in the same tempo. It just sounds awful. So you need to have uh, timing and structure tight if you're going at high tempo, because if not, it will just sound like a DJ is fucking up something, which never sounds good. For those that don't understand what I'm talking about, you can look forward to Hoffman's set later tonight. Well, I'm sure he'll be fucking up at least one mix just to prove my point. <laughs> right. And secondly, you also have to have tighter sound at higher tempos for the same reasons again. It's... Uh, at high tempos, you don't get away with anything. If you do like a 80 BPM hip hop track, you basically don't have to do anything because there's, um, if you have like a crash cymbal or a hi hat that sounds really, <laughs> it'll just, it'll still just be there once a second or once every two seconds. So it doesn't really matter. But if you have it four times in a quarter of a second, then it will matter because it'll be a constant <laughs> sound in the ears of the listener. So higher tempo, you need to tighten up stuff. And obviously then, for lower tempos, you can loosen up on the feel, and you, there's no real need for an extremely controlled sound mix either. Although it will sound better if you actually do it, but still, if you listen to a lot of 80s hip-hop, uh, they didn't spend too much time on their EQs because they probably didn't have any. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> so, and then you need to decide if your break is what's carrying the track or if it's just kind of working with the other stuff to, to build... Uh, a nice rhythm. So if the beats have the main focus, you can make them b as big and brash as you want, and you probably should, and you can make them sound large. It's uh, meaning that you can allow them to have um, a big part of the frequency spectrum. You, you don't have to take away as much. 
Uh, you can add lots of reverb to them, basically do whatever you want because they're still going to be the centerpiece of your tune. And uh, as I said, dense in frequency, you can just let the beat be everywhere it wants to be. And come back to this and I'll show you an, uh, an uh, frequency analyzer. Uh, but if the rhythm section is basically supporting the melodies, if you're writing a pop tune, if you have vocals, uh, and that's basically, if, uh, at least from where I come from, it's if you have vocals in a tune, they are the centerpiece of your tune. So they should be up front, meaning all the other stuff has to be a bit more in the back for the vocals to be up front, because not everything can be loudest, really. Uh, so then it should just be there to build on the rhythm of your melodic content. It should actually fit with your melodies, with your riffs, with your vocals. And it should be doing its job without stealing too much focus, meaning you have to take it down a bit in volume. You have to remove certain frequencies to let other instruments shine through. And um, basically controlled in frequency so that it doesn't really become annoying or suddenly pops into steel just because there's a crash. It just takes over for a second. So you need to just basically control it a bit more. And it should obviously be in the background. If it's not in the front, it should be in the background. So um, <coughs> again, before we start preparing a breakbeat, this is, of course, work. It's marginally more interesting than sorting your sample library, which is, you know you really should do that, but it's not really that fun. Um, Still, uh, there are some things you can do with breakbeats before you start importing them to tracks that you probably should or at least consider to do at some point. It's great for hungover Sundays. So um, basically, uh, a lot of the old recordings will be in stereo. And this is important because I have to start Cubase again. So here's the hoping it doesn't really want to rescan all my VSTs. No. Yeah, this looks good. Right, so uh, of course now I took one of your uh, uh, channels away for myself, so it'd be a little bit harder to hear this, but still, this is uh, <coughs> the original break as it is, the stereo recording. <laughs> think could you just turn the speaker a bit more towards the audience like yeah just uh, even a bit more I can still hear myself yeah that's fine okay so I'll just try it again and, and try listening to the differences between the channels <laughs> possibly you can hear exactly what the differences are but it's definitely different okay so let's listen to the left channel in isolation you will notice that the left channel is really nice and dry. There's not much reverb. It's got um, distinct drums. It's a clean thing. The right channel, on the other hand, it sounds like this. And this is another typical thing that you will hear in a lot of old recordings. You just put all the reverb on one side, all the dry sounds on the other side. And uh, it was, um, if you listen to stereo versions of old Beatles tracks, uh, there are drum breaks to be sampled from Beatles tracks. Uh, they will just put their, let's say, their drum kit and bass guitar on one side and vocals and guitars on the other side. So f um, when you're looking for breakbeats, uh, make sure that you actually consider the stereo aspect and, um, and find something that fits. I think we have a question in the middle of the audience. The nice guy in the white sweater. So can you hear me? Okay, so about the having the reverb on one channel instead of having it it's in stereo. I was just wondering why is that? Why not having reverb on both, you know, right and left channel? Uh, basically because, uh, you have, as I said, most of this stuff are from the 60s and 70s. So um, uh, nowadays, in, for instance, in Cubase, I have unlimited stereo channels. I can do whatever I want. The only limitation is basically my CPU. Back in the days, you would have a uh, four or eight channel console, possibly not even stereo tracks. So, and also, um, they basically had less options with their material. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be by design, since they're actually having a stereo track, but it's, it's, they had limited options of dividing content in their mixes. 
So, and that's basically it. And also when you did, um, uh, if you do drum kit recording now, you will have like everywhere from three to 16, 17 microphones. Back in the day, channels and, and, and tape, which they recorded on, which also may, might be alien to a lot of you, uh, but they recorded on actual tape that has a limited amount of channels as well. So uh, they would often record a drum kit with one or two microphones, and, and perhaps even three. So you had one microphone on a kick drum and one microphone, an overhead hanging above the drum kit, and that's what you had. Or maybe you could ha even have two microphones over the drum kit, but then you would be in a high and expensive studio. Um, and uh, if they added artificial reverb to it, that would be its own separate channel. Um, and so basically it just chose to place it around. It's different in different tracks, and different studios had different styles of producing and different sounds. So, um, I don't know, if you need the uh, reasons beyond that, I guess you'll have to find some engineers from the 60s and 70s and ask them why did you do exactly that. But uh, a lot of these things are due to limitations in the tools they had available. Okay. So today it's, it's not a problem to have reverb on, on both uh, ch channels. I mean, it's, it's not well, a design decision or something like that. It's a decision based internally on what you want the sound to be. Okay. If you want reverb on one side for some reason, then you do that. Okay. There is no technical constraints anymore that's, that limits you to it. No. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah. So uh, that was stereo break. So it's basically as easy as listen to your break beat, listen to the separate channels, figure out what uh, using the one or the other channel will give you. There's uh, obviously when you listen to these two, you have the clean one and the not so clean one. It's not, but this, this might be good for a track as well. You have to evaluate what it sounds like and what you want the, the breakbeat to do for you. The thing to be is just to be conscious that there are differences between the channels and you should inspect that when you, when you start working with the breakbeat and figure out what is most appropriate for you to use. Okay, so that's stereo break. Um, now, uh, f uh, last year I was out on a club night in Oslo and the, they played basically old jungle records from vinyl. And uh, f if you have worked with breakbeats a lot, you'll know that a lot of them, because they are recorded back in the 60s and 70s on mics of various quality and often with a bit of overdrive when they record it, record it hot, as they would call it, pushing the, the inputs on their console or pushing the input on their tape decks, uh, they will have a lot of high frequency content. So hi-hats, cymbals, uh, stuff like that will often sound very harsh. Uh, and especially when you pitch them up a bit, it will be even worse. You get a lot of high-frequency noise, basically, and ringing. And, uh, and I was wondering, because we were listening to these old jungle tracks, and the, all the breaks sound so clean and nice. And they had like, uh, lots of punch, and there was, was high-end there, but it's not nasty in any way. And then I considered that uh, jungle producers in the early 90s basically didn't have all the access to the equipment I have and didn't have unlimited EQs on the channel to just remove stuff they didn't want to have. So, okay, so why was this? And what you'll have to understand about old samplers is they had limited amount of memory. So you could have like perhaps eight seconds of sample memory if you ran at the sampler's full quality, let's say 44 kilohertz and 12 or 16 bits. But most of the time, they would use lower bit rates so they can have, used, uh, have more stuff in the memory, more samples. And so I did some experimenting when I got back home and uh, basically just went to Wikipedia and, and looked at the technical specifications for the old Akai samplers and figured out that uh, most of the time they would use 12-bit recording in either 22 or 32 kilohertz or something like that. And so I tried to take my breaks and ran them through um, a plugin that I have. It's called Time Machine. I will show you this in Cubase. And just set it to whatever settings the, the um, archive would have. So let's see here. So I have prepared this one break. I'll just have to place the microphone down for a little bit. Like this. And I'll just play the break for you. It's the same one we just heard. I think it's the left channel version of it. No, it's still the stereo version. Okay, so uh, this is what it sounds like. The 
Okay, so it's another break. Sorry about that. I was lying. But that's the uh, that's the uh, original break as it sounds. This is recorded from vinyl by some nice guy on the internet, and this is basically how it sounds. Uh, so I use this plugin called the Time Machine. It's called something else now, and it's branded as Tone Boosters because the guy who made the plugin uh, created a company or something, I guess. It's uh, still free, so you can uh, download this VST and I think all the units as well. Um, and as you will see, I've set it to what I said I was using. It's 32 kilohertz and 12 bits of sample rate. And then there is some AD aliasing and DA aliasing. That's basically shortcomings of the digital to analog converters and vice versa on the, on the samplers, which is emulated. You have crosstalk, which is how much uh, crosstalk you have between the stereo channels. So the right channel will bleed a bit into the left channel and the other way around. And there is a simple low cut filter for just removing stuff. So uh, with this turned on, and basically this is the break is exactly the same. This plugin is the only thing that does something for the channel. It sounds now like this. I bypass it. So a lot of the high frequency noise is basically just gone away. Uh, the drums will actually be a tiny bit more punchier. Uh, just by doing the 12-bit uh, instead of 16-bit thing. I'm not entirely sure why I read a description of why that was. It had something to do with noise floors and uh, other stuff I don't really understand. I'm sure those of you who are interested in that, why I can find some description on the internet somewhere. The point is that it will sound more punchy. The beats will be more uh, compact and tight. Great. So that's basically it. And of course, you can do all sorts of setting with this. Uh, there is a C64 setting on the plugin. Uh, if you are so inclined, I mean, that's C64 beats, or even, I guess too old school even for Hoffman. So there's also an Amiga setting. That's 8 bit, 22 kilohertz. Anyway, I found that 12 bits and 32 kilohertz works fine for me. And if there's a break with a lot of stuff in the high, you can even reduce the sample rate even more. So anyway, it's a quick and easy way of, of getting that kind of old school jungly sound. And it's also a nice way to just be rid of some uh, unwanted noise in high frequency areas. And as I said, get more punchy drums, which is always good. And of course, after you've done all this, uh, a lot of times you will do this when after importing the breakbeat to a project as well, but obviously you can pitch it to the correct tempo. You can use time stretch or rather never use time stretch on beats unless you want authentic uh, aim and snares that's stretched to a second. It's an old jungle thing again. In short, just don't use time stretching. And if you use it, use it. Uh, if you need a longer tail on a crash cymbal, fine. Try it, see if it works. But time stretching always uh, fucks up everything. It, your beats will, you'll lose punch, you'll get more noise. Um, just don't do it, really. And there's, of course, the resequencing. Basically, after you chopped it up, you can start using, uh, change the sequence, change the rhythm of the beat. I'll demonstrate that. So, um, let's go like this. There is the, uh, I just uh, kept this break beat for now. The original beat, original beat, as it is. It's run through the archiving process I told you about, but apart from that, it's the original stuff. So, first of all, I pitched up to the tempo I wanted to, uh, and I will do, let's say it's four semi notes and something up. Just do that here. Yeah, now it sounds like this. which is closer to what I wanted. And then I chopped it up in the sampler using just a few bits and pieces for demonstration purposes now, but it's, uh, I have it right here. So, and then you can just start fiddling around with it. And just uh, start playing around and create something that resembles uh, a beat in some way. 
And you can do this when you just uh, are pre-processing your break bits, or most commonly will do this after you are actually going to use it in the project. But if you're out of inspiration one day or hungover, then it's, it's just something nice you can do, just getting some ideas and just playing around for a bit. And if you create something nice, you just bounce it out as audio and keep it for later. So you don't have to do this grunt work when you rather would like to make a tune. So uh, now we have a breakbeat. We have selected one. I'll continue using that for, for the demonstration. Uh, so now we'll have to make it work uh, in the sound mix. Uh, first of all, we've all already been to pitch, but pitching your break will affect your sound. It's as easy as this, and I'll demonstrate with a frequency analyzer, hopefully. Oh, it's a question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, we're talking about uh, rearranging things. Um, how does it work with rolling beats? Uh, I hear you, you can uh, slice and dice them and then make them rolling. So uh, I was expecting you to say something about it when you uh, talked about uh, rearranging stuff All right. uh, a moment ago. Yeah, so uh, well, depends on what you want to do. I have uh, resequenced this for, let's say, uh, for the section. So I had made the beat that resembles something like what I was playing around with. Um, basically, let's see here. That's uh, an audio version of what I did from the sampler. It's uh, if it's rolling or not. This is a question of definition. It's basically, as with all music, it's. Uh, a question of feel and what you actually think would be rolling. I don't, I don't mean the, the um, feeling of rolling, but um, in drum and bass you have uh, really fast rolling beats on some uh, yeah. tracks. And um, I don't know any more technical term than that, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, with Yeah, it's... Um, uh, uh, it uh, also, like, uh, this is doing stuff like this is the basis of uh, being able to create a beat. Uh, I chose this beat for uh, the demonstration, but you can basically do whatever you want. I um, can't remember if I did more straightforward drum bass stuff for the other things. Let's see what we have here. That's still not... Uh, no. Uh, I don't know, it's sequencing a beat after you chopped it up is basically up to you. Uh, if you increase the tempo, if you, uh, you will sequence stuff in another way. This is kind of like a half time, more, uh, more steppy thing, I guess. Um, we, um, I will have one of the examples when I talk about breakbeat layering r later on, which is probably be a better example of a rolling drum bass beat. So when we come to that part, you. Uh, hopefully you'll understand a bit more what I'm talking about and ask your questions, and I think that's the best I can do for now. Right. Going to be talking about the mix first, and uh, we'll get some more examples and different examples later. We'll do a hip-hop beat, we'll do a drum bass uh, thing as well. So I'll just uh, move on and uh, come back to you again. Okay, so where were we? Uh, yeah, pitching the break affects your sound. Um, <coughs> Just bring this uh, back again. So, um, as you said, this is the original pitch for this break. This is where it was. Now, if you now inspect, um, this is a frequency analyzer. Um, it basically shows how the sound looks in a XI coordinate. You will have frequency along the uh, the X grid, and on the Y grid is basically amplitude or volume. So bass is to the left, treble is to the right, volume is up and down. So if you see how this looks, and you can also obviously use your ears to hear it, this is basically how it looks in, in its uh, original tempo. So that's a lot of you know, a lot of bass stuff. The Drums are at the original pitch, so yeah, the kick drum actually sounds like a bass drum. 
So if we pitch it up, let's say, seven semi notes, uh, it will sound like this. And you see that you basically transpond, uh, transpose the the uh, frequency response the whole uh, way up there. As if you, it's especially easy if you see the uh, snare drum, which is the big peak in the middle. <laughs> the one that looks like a middle finger. Yeah. Makes, and you will see that move uh, quite a bit up when I pitch it up. So if you're going to pitch your break, you should start by doing that before everything else because it will change how the break sounds and how it's uh, placed in the frequency spectrum at all. So that's what you do first if you're going to pitch your break. A lot of people like to keep the break the original pitch and just chop it into very small pieces and resequence it. Fine. If you're going to pitch it, start by pitching it. And then you will have the basics as volume, panning, uh, equalization. Uh, volume, you should all be familiar with that. You find the right volume for the break in your mix and you leave it there. Uh, panning, putting stuff to the left and to the right. It's more uh, relevant if you're using several breaks and layered thing, then you might want to have one break on the one side and one on the other side. To, for example, have the tambourines from the think break on the left and some rides from another break on the right. It's generally a good idea to try to get some stereo separation for your auxiliary content, not your main kick drum and snare and stuff that should be dead center in the middle but for other stuff it's good to spread it out a bit because uh, it opens up the uh, the sound mix a bit more the soundscape a bit more equalization we'll start start talking about now or eq as it is and i'll talk you have two uh, ways of doing eq there is one which I, which i am going to talk about which is called corrective eq is where you remove stuff you don't want basically what's boom that's uh, low frequency noise and ringing, which is what I call typically noise from uh, hi-hats, rides, cymbal. They often have a distinct kind of uh, ringing <laughs> to them. <laughs> um, and uh, the other way of doing EQ is obviously uh, boosting the parts you want to be louder. So if you want more um, kick in your kick drum, you would boost somewhere around 100 hertz. If you want more um, kind of the chest um, part of the snare drum, you'd boost somewhere between 150 and 200 hertz and so on like that. I'm not going to be talking about that because that's basically just general sound mix. What I will be talking about is corrective EQ because it's uh, especially important when working with samples and working with sample breaks. So uh, corrective EQ is basically, as I said, removing stuff you don't want. Um, so I've prepared this right here because doing uh, corrective EQ on the speakers that are not pointed towards me is not really going to work that well. So I cheated a bit and prepared something. So this is the break we have uh, without any EQ work done with it. There are some problems with this uh, break. It's, it sounds nice, it, but it still has some problems. So, first of all, I'm probably going to be doing a bass-heavy uh, track, because that is what I do. So, uh, this EQ has uh, four bands. The first band, the one that's on the bottom and to the left, is basically a, a high-pass filter. So, I set that to 100 hertz. We'll probably adjust that later on after I place my bass line and so on. The point is that if you're having sub-bass content in your track, you want the sub-bass content to be the only sub-bass content in your track. So you don't want low boom from bass drums or anything else in the, uh, basically below somewhere around 70 to 80 hertz. You basically just want bass there for the bass to be loud. Um, best example in the world, listen to pendulum tunes. And notice uh, how little bass content there is when there's no bass content. They remove everything clinically and basically use a sine wave for the sub bass. And obviously, if you heard a pendulum track on a big sound system, you'll know they have a lot of bass in their tunes. And that's the way to go about it. Remove everything you don't want in the sub-bass area, meaning remove everything, and then just have pure sine bass below it. So uh, put a high pass filter on it. Put it at 100 hertz for now. And <coughs> that basically makes it sound probably not that much different than these speakers, I guess. Or sound.
You can hear it a bit on the bass drum. Not that much. So second thing I thought was um, around 250 hertz, there's a lot of, there is reverb on this. And the drums, if you play a drum in a room, it will get to the sound of the room as well. You get reverb on your kicks or your snares. Uh, typically, you don't want that. It sounds like mud, so I removed that as well. You have to be careful about these things, though, because if you take away too much, this is a bit too much, at least when the brake is alone like it is right now, it will sound really thin and flat. So you'll have to uh, weigh your need for a clean mix against the need for having any low mid end at all. If you take away too much, then your snares will sound like snaps, which snares shouldn't really sound like. And then there's some ringing in the top. This is probably going to be harder to spot just right away, but I'll invert the, um, the EQ and boost what I actually removed. And since I'm already talking about this, this is the way you find these ringing frequencies. You take an EQ, uh, you boost it instead of reducing it, and you just sweep across the spectrum while your loop's playing. And when you find these places where there are ringing in, in the mostly the cymbals and hi-hats, they will really stand out. Uh, be careful with volumes when you do this because it, it hurts when you hit the right frequency. Anyway, you sweep up and down the frequency, find where it rings, take it down, and it sounds better. And again, you have to be careful with how much you remove. Because when you found the, uh, the ringing frequency, you basically want to remove it altogether. So you just take however low the EQ can go and just t minus 24 dB and just like <laughs> remove it. Uh, the problem with that is that you will remove a lot of other stuff as well. So what you need to do is just use the, uh, the, the gain uh, knob on the EQ, and, and it's kind of like dial in the setting where you can't hear the ringing anymore, but you have to be just at the point where you can't hear the ringing anymore. So you take it up a bit now, and when you start hearing it, take it out, and then just leave it exactly there. And the correct spot is almost always higher than you think it is. So uh, you have to A, B a bit, turn the EQ band on and off, and, and listen to what you're actually doing and just to try to fiddle around a bit to find the right volume level for it. And that's it. And I found, I think there's one more. This is higher up. Here, yeah, this is a really high frequent clicking. And then it's gone. So that's corrective EQ. Uh, it's important. You should do it first before you do every, anything else. So after you find the pitch and the volume, start doing corrective EQ and remove stuff that you don't want. Because you want to take this away before the signal goes into any other signal processors, like compressors or stuff like that. You want to take it out as early as possible. Um, when you do normal EQ, you often want to do that later in the signal chain. So that is something you might even want to do after compression when you want to boost stuff up a bit. So you do corrective EQ first, you do normal EQ more or less last, but always this first. And then, of course, uh, as we already touched upon several times, uh, there are reverb on most of the old breaks. It's to some extent what makes them sound cool, but also, especially at higher tempo, it is something that could uh, mess up your sound and make it a bit more muddy. So. Um, to tighten up a break, obviously you can resequence it, which is basically what you want to do first anyway, because you want to create a rhythm. And uh, what I usually call manual enveloping, which is working with the audio directly. But that means you will have to make audio out of it first. So I'll just uh, show that really fast because it's uh, not much to talk about. I just have the break as audio, chopped it up, and basically just... Uh, closed in on the snippets I'm using. So I've cut away a lot of stuff. And when you do that, always, always, always remember to fade out the end of your audio. So it actually stops at zero, not at either above or below the zero point. Because then you get small clicking sounds. And you don't want those. 
that's really all I have to say about it. And the, for the enveloping part, you'd start slow and then just suddenly uh, goes away. Again, this is something you just have to experiment with and find something that works for the uh, part you're working on or the hit you're working on, really. Um, if you don't have the luxury of editing it as audio, uh, or you're lazy like me, or just don't like it, you can use what's called an expander. Um, how many of you know what a compressor is? Show of hands, please. Okay, excellent. How many of you know how a compressor actually works? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, f when you have a compressor, there is a tr uh, there's a threshold setting, which is interesting. It's, uh, it's measured in dB, typically at least. And it's basically, uh, for a compressor, everything that goes above the threshold is reduced by a ratio. So the ratio knob is there. So if it goes, if you have a ratio of uh, three, and I think the guys probably all the way in the back who was really confident that they knew how compressors work would arrest me again if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong. But if the ratio is three, then if it's uh, three dB above the threshold, it will be reduced to one dB above the threshold. And yeah, I think I get some nodding from the sound engineer, so I got that one right. Hi, right, welcome, guys. Just take a seat. And an expander does uh, basically the opposite. It takes everything below the threshold and reduces it. The radio system works in the same way, but it reduces everything below the threshold. So that means you can use it to remove um, the silent parts of whatever you have. And typically, if you have a snare hit with a reverb on it, then the snare hit will be loud, and the reverb, will, the tail of it, will just be uh, not loud. <laughs> and then there are normal attack and release uh, settings. Typically, attack is how fast after you've gone below the threshold, the compressor will start to do its work. And release is basically how fast after you reach the threshold. Again, it, the expander will do nothing. So typically, I use a short release setting because I want the hits to be uh, precise. But you can make the hits softer by increasing the release time. It's, it's <laughs> an expander is basically doing everything you'd, you'd expect backwards. So for those of you familiar with attack and release for enveloping, it it's just doesn't seem right until you start thinking about it because it does it backwards. Attack is not attack, release is not release. The release thing will actually um, work with the attack part of your sound. It's a bit of a head fuck, but you get around to it. So anyway, um, back to the break. Still sounds like this. This is with the corrective EQ applied. As I said, it should always be done first. You will notice to the left that the studio EQ is there. It's a copy of the um, corrective EQ track. It sounds exactly the same. And I've uh, bypassed the expander for now, so it still sounds like this. So if we apply the expander like this, And suddenly you have a really, really tight, it just basically removed all the room sound. So it's a bit of a stream example, but it's just to show you how it works. If you want to loosen up a bit on this, you could do that either by decreasing the ratio, meaning that there will be uh, less effect from the expander, or you could increase your attack times, meaning it will take longer time before it actually kicks in. So. So the attack basically um, uh, controls how tight you want the uh, sound to be. And depending on what you want, if you're going to use this as kind of your main, uh, main rhythm, maybe you want it as tight as in the, in the example. And just add reverb to it later, for instance. Or add other breaks lo with lower volume and more, uh, or a looser sound. So that's one way of doing it, and this is a real nice way of doing it if you're working with your beats in the sampler, not as audio, because then you would ha don't really have the uh, luxury of doing manual enveloping, unless your sampler support it, but this is still easier, and it's a better way for lazy people like me. Uh, already did the, um, the um, manual uh, enveloping, so I'll just skip that, and we'll just do... We already talked about compression, how compression works. It's, uh, once again, it's just a basic, um, it's just, it's just a basic sound mix thing, so I won't be talking a lot about it. But of course, uh, what you do is that you, and uh, 
<laughs> now I'll really explain the expander, so I'm going to fuck my own head about it. But uh, So the compressor does the opposite thing. So it will take the loud sounds of your beat and reducing them by the factor that's, uh, that's the ratio and with the envelopes and stuff. So uh, what you can do, is, and then you, after, you can, after you've reduced the volume of the high, uh, the high amplitude parts of your sound, you can gain or increase the volume afterwards, and then this more silent parts, like for instance the hi-hat will be uh, louder because you can turn it up more without clipping. And that's basically it. Uh, compressors are hard. I don't really understand them myself, um, but that's how it works. I made up uh, just a short thing here. This will actually even tighten up the stuff a bit more. There we go. And then that change is probably even so subtle it's not really, you can't really hear it here. But it will make a difference when you're laying this stuff with other with uh, other parts of your sack. I'm already at 12. Shit. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll just have to rush through this. I'll just... Uh, <laughs> damn. I'm really shit at planning. But I think uh, I started a few minutes after 11, so I'll just uh, take some of the volunteers. So reinforcements. Um, you have this breakbeat, uh, you might want to have a more compact and uh, controllable uh, drum sound. So that means you add single hit samples for control and punch, so you find a nice kick drum sample from the sample library. Please don't use the Vengeance sound packs, everyone else using them, find something other. But if you must, they're really good, so you probably end up using them anyway. And you can get a nice controlled kick and snare sound out of it. Quick example. Uh, this is the reinforcement right here. So you have the original break. Still sounds as it is sounded all the time. Sounds like this. Add single hits. Should still sound, have the same sound, but now you have more compact um, kicks and snares, so it'll, it'll come through better on the sound system, it'll hit the chest like it should, it'll have good low frequency uh, kick, but still be controlled. So you typically always want to use single hits together with uh, breaks for, for different stuff. Group processing, I think I'll just skip that part and just talk real quick about it. Of course, when you added single hits, you have two channels with breaks and drums, so you take them into a group channel, and then you can do stuff like EQ there again. Uh, you can do saturation, which is basically a nice way of doing distortion, just to get a kind of thicker sound. A lot of old stuff that was bounced to old tape decks will have this sound because they just uh, kind of push the input levels a bit on the tape uh, recording equipment. Now you can do that with plugins. Uh, you do compression on everything, and it obviously sends for reverb, or you can do filters. Uh, to just everything you'd want to do on your entire rhythm section at once. Um, this is already done for this reinforced part right here. What I've added is some uh, overdrive, uh, tape emulation, some drive, some other stuff, uh, and a filter. So. Stuff like this. This is probably something you want to do on the entire rhythm section at once, so you create a group channel or a bus and do it right there. Obviously, you can do sends, which is fine, which is reverb and delay. I'm assuming you know what that is. So send that here. Just give it a more spacious feel so it doesn't sound artificial anymore after tightening it up. And uh, yeah, so also about using breakbeats for breaks. Um, you can do different breakbeats for different parts of your track. So I'm just taking a quick thing here, which has a, a mellow part first, and then the main beat comes back in. And you'll notice that I've used different breakbeats for the different parts of, of the, the track. Cubase is still running. Oh, gee. great. Thank you. Let's try it again. 
And the Cubase is still running. I was really hoping that would sort it out, but what do you know? This is a mellow part. It's basically the, the break that's in the mellow part. It's just like really nice, has some rides to it. It's just, it still has a, a steady rhythm and it's fast and everything, but it's not as massive as when you throw in the aim and break when the bass drops. And you can do uh, different breaks in different bars just to kind of keep it always switching and always keeping up intensity. And it will sound something like this. <laughs> It's just, it's the same main beat, but you just switch the brakes you're using behind it, and it will kind of like always add something new. It will feel, I don't know, uh, noisy and, and uh, stressful, which is sometimes good. <laughs> so use other brakes for fills. Uh, a lot of brakes are re re really suited for doing a main rhythm. Uh, and you have other brakes that just basically the drummer going off on a solo or something. You can use small snippets of that and just use them to add something interesting just before the end of a bar. I really need to stop doing that. And now you have stuff that's layering breaks. So in the, in the examples, we've been working with one single breakbeat all the time. Obviously, you can add as many breakbeats as you want and have them on top of each other, and they will fill different purposes uh, in your track. So. What we've been working on so far is, is the kind of like the main beat. It's a simple and nice rhythm. It's got a nice kick and snare, stuff like that. But it's not really that fast. So we can add another break, like for instance the think break with the tambourine on top of that to get more of like action on the 16th. So it feels faster. And also there's not really much uh, shuffle and groove in the thing we've been working on so far. So you can add another break that has like these things and so far. Am I dead? Yeah, <laughs> I got two more minutes, all right, excellent. I'll just do the uh, layering examples, and uh, I'm sorry for the bad timing of this, and um, <laughs> I'll happily, um, I sit in the hall, uh, be, feel free to just come uh, talk to me and ask me stuff, because I guess the question section is not going to happen. Uh, I'll do go with this right now. This is a uh, track we're working on right now. It's a remix of uh, Gamma, which is an old Outrax demo from 2006. We're basically recreating the tune and going to release it later on on the Nordic Breakbeat Conspiracy record label. We started the record label for that. Uh, so this is the beats. I just want to uh, show you something here. Um, just start. <laughs> Play short snippet first. Yeah, I think that's quite enough. So uh, <laughs> we talked about rolling beats. And these beats are, as per my definition, rolling. This is a drum and bass beat. It rolls nicely around. So we build it up like this. We started with single hits to get uh, kind of clean uh, drums on it. It sounds like this. And these are just single hit samples. Kicks, uh, snares, another kick for the, the offbeat kicks, and some hi-hats. Then we started playing around, started adding stuff, and, and this will sound weird to you when I play it alone. This, we found an Amen, and it's played at entirely the wrong pitch. So it sounds like this. It just sounds like a mess. If you add the metronome, you probably have to be a prog rock drummer to kind of see where this is going. But, uh, and the reason we added the, the wrong pitch, we were just previewing samples in Cubase and uh, didn't really control the pitch of them. But we preview them with the single hit uh, rhythm already rolling. And then it sounds like this. <laughs> uh, 
and it works really nice together with the uh, the rolling kick drums of the uh, of the main section and the the snare drum from the Amen track just sounded like it was completely out of place. Now there's a fine small little shuffle thing, and so <laughs> so that works so fine. We we just okay. So we accidentally did that. Let's try adding another break at entirely wrong everything. So we added this one right here for a high frequency action. This is the ride thing. Sounds like a mess as well. I'm out of time. But still, together with the amen and the break, still sounds like a mess. But now it's going. Add a tambourine. And the last break. And then we suddenly have a rolling beat and we were really happy. And then we went out, went to Ram at Warehouse London and got drunk and listened to Andy C for the entire night. It was great. All right, so uh, apologies to whoever's uh, next and all the guys who came to listen to him uh, for going over the time. I hope it's been uh, inspirational at least and possibly educational. Um, I have some more examples that I, uh, that I had. Come find me in the hall, uh, pester me about it and um, ask questions. All right, thank you.